to. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you all here for our annual judicial clerkship and internship panel. Um, we have a great panel, some of whom may be familiar faces to those of you who have been here before. And we have uh, a new face as well. Um, what I'd like to accomplish today is I'd like you all to learn a couple of things about judicial clerkships and judicial internships. Um, on the big picture, I just want you to get an idea of what the application process is for being an intern while you're in school and being a law clerk after school in each of the courts. They're different, and these are uh, some of the courts in Massachusetts in the state system. There are federal courts in Massachusetts. There are other courts elsewhere. So this is um, a slice of the pie, but a very representative sample of some of the courts that you'll probably be applying to if that's where your interests lie. Um, in addition to that, though, I really want to talk, and I'd like our panelists to talk, about two other things in addition to the process. One is just about what the experience of being a law clerk is like as a potential postgraduate um, employment opportunity. Um, four of the five members of this panel have done that, so I think that not only can they talk about it in their professional capacity as hiring and working with clerks, but also in their own experience. And then lastly, um, what I really hope comes across is the value of both a judicial internship and a postgraduate clerkship. I would like all of them to talk with you about that, about in their opinion what they think it is. I'll chime in if I think there are things that aren't being covered, um, but I'm pretty confident that they're going to have their bases covered because they have uh, amongst them an enormous amount of experience and expertise. Uh, before we get started, um, just a couple of things. So first, sign-in sheets are on the side. Make sure you sign in and for both students that you sign out as well. Um, there are also three handouts, and including a fourth one, which is our panel. So if you have any interest in that, that's also on the side with uh, some of the extra food. Um, you'll see one of the handouts is the Massachusetts State Court System. And as I said, for those of you who are interested in doing um, postgraduate clerkships, you should look at this because you should probably be thinking about where you want to do your in-school internship in one of these places. Um, and then there are two other handouts about clerkships, one very general, one more specifically about some uh, federal administrative opportunities that may be right for some people. Um, just so that the panel gets a sense of who's here, um, can I do a show of hands? How many people here are in their first year of law school? Um, how many are in their last year of law school? Okay, so the middle years of law school. Okay, so pretty good distribution, maybe a couple more first years. Um, how many of you are PILF students, public interest law fellows? Look at that. So what I want to tell our panel about our public interest law fellows, for those of you who are not familiar with them, is that um, this is a program that the students get accepted to when they're accepted to school. It's before they start classes. And they agree to pursue careers in public interest, public service, after graduation for four years at least. So um, a lot of these people have already made the commitment to do public service and they might be a really good pool of applicants for you all to get to know over the next couple of years. Um, my last question is, how many of you had have, has, have had, let me try that again, how many of you have had some prior experience working in a court or judicial system in some capacity? And of those people, how many of you worked for a judge as a, some sort of a clerk? So for the people who did not work for a judge, who were, the, who were those of you? There were a couple of other hands up. What I didn't you know, know if you work? meant, I would, I've been working with an attorney who's in the court like 90% of the time, so in that respect, I would say yes. And that's the person you met doing on campus here? Yes. Okay. <coughs> other people who have been working in the courts? Everybody else is shy. Okay. Um, well, those of you who did work in the courts and did work with judges, the rest of you might want to identify those people and ask them some questions. Um, I know one of our first years got a really great gig with one of our Massachusetts courts before she started law school. Um, clearly someone who's 
figured out a way to get in and get herself noticed. So I think you should all look at each other as resources um, so that uh, you can all help one another out. Having said that, um, we also have a growing list of alumni who have been clerks in our Massachusetts courts and elsewhere in Pennsylvania, in Connecticut, in New Jersey, and so on. Um, so again, these are resources for you, and if you want to or need to get in touch with these folks, I can help you connect with them um, as appropriate. And then, um, I think with that, I'll stop my talking so I can introduce the panel. And once I introduce the panel, I think what I'd like to do is have each person speak for five or ten minutes, whatever suits them all about um, the topics that we've talked about and anything else that they think is important to share with you that I've forgotten to mention. Um, in terms of introductions, uh, to my immediate left is Romeo Kamba. He's the manager of legal research services for the Superior Court of Massachusetts. He's been doing this since 2005. Um, and he was a clerk for the court for two years right after graduating law school. Yes. So he has returned to the mothership that he first landed on when he graduated. Uh, Denise Fitzgerald, similar job, manager of legal research services at the probate and family court. Um, she is still at the job that she was, still at the employer that she was with when she graduated, although she has had a steady advancement of clerking, chief law clerk, um, administrative attorney and now the manager of legal uh, services. So uh, she is someone who has a lot of knowledge about this. And um, we'll be happy to explain to you why her court is the most happening place to work because everything <laughs> happens there. Um, next, we are honored to have uh, Chief Justice Cutler. She is the Chief Justice of the Land Court. She uh, assumed that title last January. Uh, from what I understand, though, you had had five years on the bench before that. Yes. And your immediate predecessor was Karen Tri Shire. That's right. Who I think, I don't know if any of you were here when she had come one year. She's a terrific person, and I am sure that um, if she's any indication of what it's like to work in the land court, uh, Judge Cutler will also have wonderful things to tell you and experience with some of our most recent graduates. Uh, Michael O'Loughlin. Um, only Richard has to go after him, and that's because Michael tends to steal the show. He, he likes to illustrate why it's fun to work in the courts and, and, what, and what else, what, what the outside of the box value of having a clerkship. So um, that's my teaser for Michael. Um, Michael is now uh, an assistant clerk magistrate at the Boston Municipal Court. Um, he used to be a senior administrative attorney there. So again, he's someone that you might want to talk to about his career path. Um, we do have a handful of grads who also go that route, and that is how they um, pursue their legal career. And last, but absolutely not least, is Richard Klein. Um, not only is Richard a local person to our area here, but he has been at the appeals court as a clerk since 1990. He is officially what is called a career clerk. Uh, he has been a cheerleader of this institution for as long as I've known him. and. Um, I think we're really starting to make some traction there as well. As some of you know, we have um, a student, another student who's going to be clerking there next year. We had a student who was clerking there last year, so all good things. Um, so having said all that, uh, Romeo, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Romeo Camba. Uh, I'm the manager of legal research services for the Superior Court. Uh, normally, I, I leap right into talking about the Superior Court, but I thought this year I'd change things up a little bit and talk a little bit more about my personal experiences. Um, back when I was a 2 well at Northeastern Law, I was wandering the hallways one day when I came upon the odor of pizza. And when you're a student and you smell pizza, you follow it. Right? So I followed the smell of pizza, and it led into a room much like this, where there was a panel much like this and a bunch of students sitting much like you. And it happened to be a panel about clerkships uh, in the various courts. So I sat down. And got my free pizza, listened to what they had to say, and decided, hey, this sounds good, I'll apply. And that was the start of my legal career. Because, because of the smell of pizza, I decided to apply for clerkships, which then became the first step of the rest of my legal career. Um, it was a very fortuitous odor of pizza, uh, because <laughs> it was pro probably the perfect experience for me right out of law school, and I think for a lot of people, uh, for a few reasons. One, first of all, uh, law school, it just, the whole thing just seems so academic, right? It's like, I'll get a job maybe, right? Um, but it turns out that 
uh, be, being selected in this very highly selective clerkship process was itself a confidence booster. You know, hey, I'm hireable, that's great. Um, and then to actually go in there and work on real cases uh, involving real people, people's, uh, uh, people's rights, their liberties, their money, their businesses, having that, being involved in things that hinge on that was itself a confidence booster. Um, and of course, in that process, learning about the actual law and learning about actually writing for, uh, actually, actually writing and what constitutes good legal advocacy and effective legal writing and all those kinds of things serves as a very, makes the clerkship a, a wonderful bridge between, again, the sort of theoretical nature of law school and the fact that at some point you're going to have to go out there and represent clients. So, you know, from law school to representing clients, having that clerkship in the middle as the bridge was a uh, a wonderful experience. Um, and finally, it really just served, post-clerkship, it served as a terrific stepping stone um, to new positions. I think having that position, having on your resume the fact that you were trusted to do this kind of things, that judges relied on the kind of work that you did, again, s serves as, uh, uh, as an indicator of perhaps you're the right candidate for these employers who are looking for, uh, for, for people. And certainly gives you a, a, a foot, uh, a, a little push compared to say someone who's fresh out of law school. Um, and beyond that, just the network that you develop. You know, you develop a great deal of camaraderie with your fellow law clerks. And in my case, I stayed for two years, which meant that the people who I was there for the first year, they went off and got their jobs uh, before me so that when it was my turn, I actually had people I could call and say, hey, have you heard anything? Can you tell me about this? Can you tell me about that? And that actually proved to be very, very effective. And going forward um, in, in the rest of my uh, career, by the way, after the clerkship, I worked for a firm, then I worked for the Attorney General's office, and then I came back to the Superior Courts to um, help manage this program. But at each step if, of my career where I was making my job change, there were former law clerks there who helped uh, give me advice, guide me, indicate, you know, tell me of this opportunity and that all, all along the way. And so, <coughs> I really do mean it when I tell you that odor of pizza was very fortuitous. <laughs> I mean, it really just led to every step that I took, it seemed, every time I advanced to a next step, it seemed to me that the previous steps were ideally suited to help advance me to that next step. And that first step of all of those was the clerkship. Now, um, about the Superior Court, the Superior Court is one of the courts, one of the trial courts uh, of Massachusetts. I, I believe there's a total of seven, right? Okay. Um, and some courts in Massachusetts, some of the trial courts in Massachusetts are courts of general jurisdiction and others are specialized, um, which you'll learn more about. The Superior Court is a court of general jurisdiction. We do civil and criminal cases. And um, you know, on the civil side, we have a certain amount of money where the damages need to be uh, before it gets into, gets into Superior Court, um, that sort of thing. We have 80 judges. Uh, at any one time, half of them are assigned to civil cases and half of them are assigned to criminal cases. And right now we have, um, I think, a total of 30 law clerks. So you can do the math. It's obviously not a one-to-one -one ratio. The way it works right now is um, our law clerks are assigned to two or three judges at a time. And we have a rotation system in which the judges rotate from courthouse to courthouse, and the law clerks rotate from courthouse to courthouse. So one of my jobs as the manager is every uh, three months or so, um, sending out an email to the law clerk saying, you're going to work with this judge, or, or you're going to work in this courthouse with these judges. So uh, people often get confused. They think, it's a, is it a pool system? It's not a pool system in the sense of, um, you know, the judge calls downstairs to the law clerk's office and whoever picks up the phone gets the case. But it's more like you have specific judges who will be who will be giving you assignments. So during the course of the year, each law clerk gets to work directly with something like six to 10 different judges. It gets to develop relationships with those six to 10 different judges. Do some of the clerks, um, my impression is that the rotations tend to split up the clerk judge pairings, or am I wrong right. about that? That right. they don't travel together, they tend to travel right. in both directions. The judges go from courthouse to courthouse, the law clerks go from courthouse to courthouse. It's not in tandem. In fact, they're actually independent of each other. So it becomes like, okay, now you end up over here and now you end up over there. Um, we, the, the application process has been in flux the last few years as we slowly get 
return to normal from the times when we were dealing with a hiring freeze and, and a budget crisis in the courts. Um, in a couple of years ago, it was very late in the summer, and over, I guess, uh, over time, year to year, we've been moving slowly towards doing our hiring closer to the fall, which uh, traditionally is when we've done our hiring. So ideally, I think Denise probably wants to get to this point too, uh, we want to be able to return to the time where we can do our hiring in the fall, a full year ahead of the people who, a full year ahead of the term of, of the people who start uh, the following year. We want to just have it be like it used to be. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so that's what we're heading for. But the problem, but so, but, but while we're in flux, it's hard for me to tell you this is when we are going to do the hiring right now. So uh, unfortunately, it's re really a matter of you having to pay attention with your career services if you're interested, and um, and, and just being ready to, to apply when the time comes. Um, I don't think I want to get too much into the application process, except to give you a couple tips. Um, if you're interested in a clerkship, probably the best thing that you can do is to do a judicial internship. Um, first of all, because you get to do, it gives you a taste of what law clerks are doing and puts you in a better position to be able to argue when you apply for the clerkship that you are best suited for this particular role. Um, and even if you don't do a clerkship, it's just a terrific, terrific experience to have and a, a terrific uh, educational experience to have. If you do get a judicial internship, do well, okay? Don't make the mistake of saying, okay, I've accomplished my goal, and now I have this thing on my resume, now I'm going to coast, right? You need to impress the judges that you're working with uh, so, that, so that you are building a case as to why you should be um, eventually hired as a clerkship, uh, as a law clerk. You know, we had a, another panel a couple of days ago, and for those of you who were there, you remember when the judge said, you know, we know, they were talking to the Bristol County Bar Association, but they said, you know, we know that lawyers talk about the judges. Just so you know, the judges talk about the lawyers too. <laughs> and I think the same, I think what you're trying to do is make that same point, that if someone's reputation is terrific or horrible, probably people right. will find that out. Right, you, you know, once you're out there, you're, you're already forming your reputation. You're already forming your professional reputation. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to tell people, once you're out there, the interview has already started, whether you know it or not. Um, so uh, that's about it. When you do the application process, there's a lot of tips I could give you. I could probably give you a two-hour presentation on how to do uh, applications, and I actually have done that. Um, but I will do, uh, the one tip I will give you is to read and follow the instructions. Um, you'll be amazed, I'm amazed, <laughs> at the number of people who don't read and follow the simplest of our application instructions. I won't say that automatically disqualifies them, but it, def it doesn't give us good evidence that you know, right off the bat you're able to do what we need you to do in terms of being able to you know, read a case carefully, apply analysis, be reliable. You know, it's hard to believe that you're that per type of person if you can't read the first instruction that we give you and, and follow it correctly. So by the way, the first instruction we give you is that resumes should be uploaded in PDF format, not Microsoft Word. And a year ago, something like 10% of the applicants uh, failed to do that. So that's too high a number for people who've graduated college and are about to graduate law school and presumably are very highly intelligent people um, and highly motivated to get jobs. So, um, so I guess I'll just leave you with that. Thank you. So I don't generally start with something that's like that, uh -huh. but I want to say that um, my almost seven-year-old knows how many people didn't follow directions because <laughs> our application closed on Friday and I took all the applications, all the writing samples home with me on Friday night and Saturday I sat in my living room and opened all the envelopes and every time I opened an envelope that only had one copy of the writing sample in it, I got exasperated because the directions say submit to. And there's a reason it says submit to, but the number of people who did not submit to was astonishing. I also looked at those folks and went back to where they graduated from college and thought, not only did you graduate from college, but you're in law school now. And I thought, how can you not follow the directions? So I, I cannot echo and agree with Romeo Moore that when you do anything in life, following the directions is the first sign that you get it. And if you don't take following the directions seriously, then it does make you wonder 
how you would do at a paid job that you don't even have yet. Okay, so I, you know, I don't usually start on the, the downer, but it's so, so important. Um, it's really hard to imagine that it's not the most important thing on someone's mind. So, and it's easy, like this is the easy stuff, guys. Like you guys, you know, you don't literally want to be in the no pile because you didn't attach your references or what, and, and, and mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is, the job market's really competitive. And so what happens is employers sometimes need to figure out with all these amazing candidates, how am I gonna put some in the no pile? Like, how do you make that choice? It's not easy, it's a wonderful problem to have, but you still have to go through it fairly and, and uh, efficiently, and sometimes that just becomes, you know, what it comes down to. Now, not every job is gonna require you to follow directions and do what someone else says, and some of you will be very entrepreneurial and not do that, but that's not the position of being a law clerk at all. You know, you really are there to serve the judges. So that does lead me into, so what is a law clerk? So um, maybe you know, maybe you don't know. I think sometimes we have folks who apply to be a law clerk and they think that it's a clerk in a courtroom. And, um, and that for the majority of the courts here, that's not the case. Now I know the land court does things a little bit differently sometimes. It's not the clerk in the land. But it's not the clerk in the land. Right? So, but they do run sessions and stuff like that, more so than some of the other courts. So uh, the job of a judicial law clerk is essentially to research and write. It's a behind the scenes job. It's an extension of the judge. So you don't generally have contact with attorneys and litigants because the judges can't have contact with the attorneys and litigants in that way, or it would be an ex parte communication. So the job um, really does involve some solitary time. Uh, it does involve some really special time with a computer and, um, and some books, which if you haven't used books before, <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, and, and it's really, it is a job that involves research and writing. And so what I encourage you to think about as you're going through the process of law school is trying to figure out whether you like to research and write. Because if you don't like slash love to research and write, it may not be the job in the court for you. There may be other jobs in the court that are a better fit for you, but being a judicial law clerk may not be the one. And so it's really important as you're going through the process of figuring out how it is that you're going to be a public interest law fellow, how is that going to happen? Where are you going to fit into that public interest law? Because there are lots of ways to fit, and the judicial law clerk is a piece of that. So that sort of gives you an overview of, of what that job is. So it's research and writing primarily. So the probate and family court, as Romeo had suggested, is a court with specialized jurisdiction. And we generally have jurisdiction over domestic relations cases so those are your divorces, paternity, um, the children born out of wedlock, they used to be called illegitimate children, I don't call them that anymore. Um, but that's generally that, you know, domestic relations, uh, restraining orders, we have jurisdiction over name change, contracts for child entertainers, and then we have jurisdiction over probate matters. So a few years back, Massachusetts adopted the Uniform Probate Code, huge change in the way Massachusetts looks at probate matters. But we have jurisdiction all over probate matters, so that's wills, estates, trusts, guardianships, conservatorships, healthcare proxies. There's a big group with regard to the probate. And then we have, which is my favorite part. I know, I get excited every year. Actually, I had my boss it twice and this week has called me a legal nerd. As you can see, like my eyes light up when I like start to... It's equity jurisdiction. So equity jurisdiction, for those of you who are not familiar, is basically the opportunity the, for the court to, uh, and again, this is not, I'm not using legalese, but it's basically to say, there is no remedy at law. There's no answer to this question, but it's a legal question, and we need an answer to it. And so in Massachusetts, if you have anything that's family related, you come to the probate and family court. And Massachusetts is really open to looking at um, examining what a family is and how that operates. And because of that, we get these really exciting equity cases and the law clerks generally get them and they're usually about this big and they come in a green folder and there's <coughs> one piece of paper, maybe two. And the question is, what's, how am I gonna, how am I gonna answer this? 
and you get to basically, as a law clerk, look at what all of the states have done, you get to look at what other countries have done, and you get to try to come up with a possible solution for this case. And that is so fun and so exciting that um, that's why, you know, Leslie was saying, well, Denise will say what, but this is, it's just really exciting. And in Massachusetts, because we evolve quite quickly um, with regard to domestic relations matters and with issues relating to the family, it's pretty exciting. So other states don't move quite as quickly, um, but we're you know, pretty much on the, the forefront in a lot of ways of domestic relations issues. So that's really exciting um, for the, to be in the probate and family court. So we also have rotations. We have two six-month rotations uh, currently. We used to have three four-month rotations, and we may go back to that. The law clerks do work in a pool, and so, um, for example, in Cambridge and Middlesex, we have two law clerks, and they serve as between eight and nine judges. We have, in Bristol County, we have one law clerk who works part-time, who services all of the judges of Bristol County. Um, and so, as a law clerk, like in the Superior Court, you'll probably be able to work with between six and ten judges. It's just how you do that is a little bit different in the Superior <coughs> Court. You're not paired up with just a couple. You, in most courts, you're one law clerk and you service all of the judges in a particular division. Um, we do have law clerks that are in the eastern part of the state and we have the majority in the eastern part of the state. We have eight law clerks in the eastern part of the state and we have three law clerks in the western part of the state and we have 51 judges. So um, it's a, you know, you carry, as a law clerk in the probate and family court, you really have the, you know, you carry a lot of work for a lot of different judges based on those numbers. Um, the, for me, being a law clerk is absolutely the best job in the whole world. Leslie's laughing at me, we've known each other for way too long. So I'm gonna tell you my quick story, and I'm gonna tell you starting off, don't do this. Okay, I say this every year, don't do what I did. I um, went, I didn't go right to law school, and I worked at a middle school in Charlestown in Boston, and I loved it, and I really knew that juvenile and probate law was really where I needed to be. That was my calling. I knew that's what I wanted. I had never stepped foot in a courthouse. I went to law school in New England at night. I supported myself while I was going to law school, so I didn't have an internship. I had nothing but very good grades, which are really important because it's very competitive. So I was that legal nerd. I had very good grades, but I had nothing else, no other experience. I <laughs> applied for one job, and it was this job. I got an interview, I got a second interview, and I got the job, and I have stayed there ever since. It's when you find your calling, when you know where that is, if you really have it, you've got to run with it and do everything in your power to get that thing that you want. And I did that in the way that I knew how, which was to get really good grades and stay focused on the grades because I knew I wasn't going to be able to do all those other things. I don't recommend that you only apply to one job or to have that sort of single-mindedness because it's not healthy. <laughs> but it is demonstrative of the fact that I really had an idea of where I was best suited to be and made sure that I did what I needed to do to get there. And the things that you need to do and you need to, and it's so good to see so many people at the beginning of their law school career here, is that one of the things that you have to do is remain focused, and grades are part of that. And um, it's not the determining, it's not the determining factor in all circumstances, but it certainly helps if you have good grades. It's an indicator of what you can do. It's not the only indicator, but it is an indicator and it is something that's measurable. And so for hiring people, it's something to be able to look at. Thank you, Denise. Judge Cohen. Okay, well, I, unlike uh, the other panelists, I never had, never had a clerkship and I never did a judicial internship. I was a single mother. Uh, raising two children and had to work full time and go to law school at night. So I just didn't have that luxury and for whatever reason when I was nearing uh, looking at the position where I was looking for a legal job, 
uh, nobody really pushed clerkships. It seemed that those only went to the top two students in the class. And so you didn't even bother to apply. Um, I see now a big change in that. Um, we have a land court, a very, very different uh, setting and situation than any of the other courts. Uh, we are very small. We only have seven judges. Uh, we sit only in Boston with occasional forays out to the west and to the south, uh, but not too many. Uh, we basically uh, do only civil, no jury trials. All of the cases are decided by the judge. Law clerks are essential to our survival. Um, we cannot do our work without those law clerks. So there is never a situation where you have somebody coming in and a jury decides and the judge needs to rule on the procedural matters and may need some research on that. But the bottom line is not the judge's responsibility, it's the jury's. In land court, every single case needs a judge to decide that matter. And we are almost entirely involved with matters dealing with land use and real estate. So, who owns Black Acre, and how can they use it? <laughs> um, and believe it or not, uh, it doesn't sound as sexy as some high energy criminal trials or you know various things. But let me tell you, people are very fond of their property, <laughs> and they do not want anybody messing with that. So. It can get highly emotional, it can get highly charged, and it is always interesting. There is never a day since I became a judge that I've woken up and said, oh God, I have to go to work. Every day there is a challenge, and that's what our law clerks get to experience, because in land court, in the good old days, before the, uh, before the budgetary crisis, every judge had a, land court, had a uh, clerk assigned to that judge. And those clerks would work for one to two years for that judge and develop an extremely close working relationship. Very, in a way, symbiotic. Um, you really begin, as a judge, to depend upon your law clerk. And so when we interview, we interview not only for, is this person get, get high grades? Is this person interested, interesting? Someone we personally can connect with? Um, you know, that our, our sort of our brains are in sync in the way they operate. Obviously, some people are very slow and thoughtful, and other people are very high energy, and you sort of have to need to have a fit. Um, so we do look at grades when we're looking at law clerk applications, but we also look at who gets it, okay? You can have extremely high grades, but really don't get the essence of what it's all about. And so when we're looking at research, it's not just, you know, give me a list of the cases that stand for the following proposition. We're looking for, I found these cases, and then I found these cases, but look at these cases over here, and here's the bottom line, okay? So we're really looking for someone who is interested in what they're working on, and really, wants to puzzle through, because a lot of what we do is puzzling, is, is getting, you know, sort of piece, it's, it's sort of like being a, a detective. You really have to sort of figure it all out. Uh, most lawyers don't help out in that regard, and I say that as an aside in the future. Um, so you would see, as a law clerk in land court, the law clerk's generally go into uh, court with the judge for all motions, all hearings, uh, and, all, and sometimes the trial and sometimes not. But you do get the opportunity to see firsthand some very, very excellent lawyering and some very, very poor lawyering. And talk about it with the judge. And you get to sort of pick for yourself and understand what is good lawyering? What is the lawyer's job when they're there before the judge? And how does it help and assist in coming t to a correct conclusion? And so uh, you, you get a lot of hands-on understanding, practical understanding of what, what the real world is like when you go out there. 
the law clerks in our um, in our court and more recently law fellows that we had the privilege of having one excellent law fellow last year uh, from this school, Stephen Brown. I don't know if you know him. Did you get to meet Mike Martin? He was there. He you know, was he was there. I, I think I didn't ever actually got yeah. to know him, but um, yeah, he was there as well. So we've had several fellowships from various uh, law schools, and, and they are treated essentially like law clerks as well. Um, but what we what we uh, find is all of those students who come to us and, and get a job, either as an intern or as a law clerk, have an excellent next step in their career. Um, they don't have a tremendous problem finding the next job, and often, even though there's no interaction directly with the lawyers who come in, those lawyers observe you. They see how you act. They see how professional you appear. And they will ask for you. They also know that you're helping to, the judge to write the decisions. And, they, and because they uh, have great respect for the judges, they have great respect for any clerks that those judges would hire for that reason. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful stepping stone, and I think um, I've seen all of our uh, all of our interns, clerks, and fellows just go on to really great things. Um, some of them have stayed on. Uh, we don't presently um, have any particular process for hiring um, on a routine basis. We are at our our maximum right now, we have five law clerks. Um, and so we have to wait until one of them decides to leave, <laughs> which they seem very happy. <laughs> um, or, uh, you know, the coffers open up a little more and uh, we get uh, permission to hire back to our regular normal level. Um, Generally speaking, there is an application process. Uh, when we have an opening, it would be posted uh, not only on the trial court website, but also on the land court's website. And uh, the process is generally fairly straightforward. The application, resume, writing sample, um, and, if you, and the contact information will be all there. Um, and then it's a matter of interviewing with one or two judges, usually. It's a fairly, fairly short process. Once we advertise, we want to get someone on board very quickly. Um, we, so we don't do it on a September to September basis. Uh, the last two law clerks we hired were last February. So you know, you just never know. Keep looking because we may wind up with an opening uh, that, that you can get. Um, Something I wanted to mention yeah. in that vein is that um, for the past I want to say at least three summers we've had students intern in the land court um, for Judge Sands. Yes. Um, we've had, and, and these are, and I can tell you that all three of those clerks have gone on to do really great things, um, some directly related to the land court and some not. The other thing is that, and, this, and I think the summer hiring is more competitive, as many of you have realized that, you know, a lot of the internships and externships you can do in the school year are get a little bit more competitive come summertime because uh, many schools unlike ours you know have no classes over the summer and everybody flocks back to where they came from before they were in law school um, but during the school year the land court also has clerkships regularly every fall every spring oh, internships yes yeah. yes there so and uh and the contact person there is a woman named Ellen Fiendaka. She is very uh, responsive if you have questions, but if that's something you know, that you're interested in, um, you should not, uh, you know, it, it is a hard court to get into just because of the small numbers. It's a smaller court, so it's harder to get into. But uh, do consider that also because the students that we've had there have thought it's been a great experience. Not that they haven't thought being at the other courts are not a good experience, but you just might not have heard about students who have clerked there because there are fewer of them. And also the internships and the, uh, the summer clerkships um, we usually post with the law schools um, two or three times a year. And um, that hasn't been as competitive uh, more recently. I don't know if people can get paying jobs, but <laughs> I can't blame them for that. Uh, but summers, actually, the people who work for us on summers love, love, love it. 
um, they get, first of all, we're right next door to the appeals court and the SJC, so at least in May and June, you can get to go over and listen to arguments and come back and talk to your judge about it or talk to the other interns. And we usually have about 10 at a time. We have pizza parties, we have, um, the judges give little lunchtime lectures uh, with cookies. <laughs> Romeo's gonna be Romeo will be there. He'll smell the pizza. If, yeah, if, if it's food I can smell, I'll be there. <laughs> and they have a great time. They, they usually wind up as sort of a, a little class that uh, they, they have lasting friendships uh, from one another from all different schools and all over. Anyhow, um, if you have any questions, I'll be here afterwards. and. Uh, I, to talk to you. I would just add one thing. When I was a law clerk for the probate family court, my second year, my first rotation, I had the pleasure of sitting in with all the land court law clerks, <laughs> and the land court judges sort of took me in a little bit. The land court law clerks, as a group, I have n and that the group of people, they were just their relationships with their judges, and the way that they operated, and how it was really just sort of something special to watch. Now as a like. Now as a grown up, I, I think back and I think it really was, it was just, it was just this cool pod of people and I was just on the outside of it, but they totally took me in. It was really great <coughs> um, it, and, I, and I don't get the sense that that's changed at all. And it's really, it's a, it's a pretty cool court to work in. It really is. <laughs> if you can't work in. <laughs> Michael. Can I um, use the podium? Absolutely, okay? please. I just want to say for the record, Michael didn't used to come, and it used to be very serious, <laughs> you know? And now that you've come, it's really, this is the highlight of the panel, oh, even for us. All this pressure, I don't know. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Michael O'Loughlin. I'm an assistant clerk magistrate of the Boston Municipal Court Central Division. The Boston Municipal Court is one of the seven departments of the Massachusetts Trial Court. I'm a graduate of Boston Latin School, Boston College, and Suffolk University Law School. I've worked at the court since April 1995 and have held a variety of positions from law clerk to administrative attorney. I was appointed as an assistant clerk magistrate in January 2013. Assistant clerk magistrates assist judges in court and also issue search and arrest warrants, decide small claims cases, hear motor vehicle appeals, as well as conduct hearings for applications for criminal complaints. I presently serve as a hearing committee member on the Massachusetts Board of Bar Overseers, where I help to conduct hearings on attorney discipline cases. In my previous position, I worked extensively with our court's internship program and hosted one student from UMass School of Law, Jeffrey Moore. Uh, Mr. Moore just passed the Mass Bar exam. I'm very honored to be here to speak to you you're very fortunate to go to school at UMass and have talented professionals like attorney Leslie Becker Wilson working on your behalf organizing programs like this one. I think this is the sixth year I've been invited here. In the past, I've talked about meeting my favorite singer, Martina McBride, and somehow related that to the practice of law. I also talked about my encounter with my favorite actor, Ashley Judd, and related that to the importance of taking chances. Last year, I spoke of meeting my hero, television journalist Soledad O'Brien, and her belief that, quote, one should lead with an open heart in their career. This year, the only celebrity I saw was Allie Reisman, the Olympic gymnast who was on the steps of Faneuil Hall appearing on Good Morning America as I was racing on my way to the Brook Courthouse to get to work. I didn't get to speak with her, so my daughter Margot said that that doesn't count. <laughs> my only props or exhibits today are in the organizational chart of the Massachusetts Trial Court, which may be helpful to you, and Taylor Swift's new album, 1989. <laughs> That's the year I graduated from college. What on earth 1989 has anything to do with the law, you'll just have to wait and see. Each year, usually around March, the court is inundated with requests from law students near and far searching for judicial clerkships. The Boston Municipal Court Department has eight neighborhood courts in Boston with 30 judges. Legal interns usually shadow a judge in the courtroom observing civil and criminal matters. A judge may ask you to observe a criminal motion to suppress evidence hearing or perhaps ask you to write a memorandum of law on the matter advising the court how to rule. Some judges will ask the intern to prepare a draft order for the court, while others will take your research and write the order themselves. Our courts also have a very busy civil caseload. 
On the civil side, you may be asked to observe civil bench or civil jury trials. Very frequently, judges will ask you to prepare a memorandum for summary judgment motions. Sometimes our Chief Justice, Deputy Court Administrator, or Legal Counsel may ask you to assist them with a project relating to the operation of the courts, implementation of new laws or court rules, or various internal or trial court committees. I have a few suggestions on how to make your internship worthwhile and successful. Number one, always arrive on time. Be courteous to everyone you meet. Dress professionally. Always look your best. Number two, Respect the confidentiality of the court and the projects you're working on. Don't take case files home without permission. Don't discuss the projects you're working on with anyone without permission. <clears throat> Number three, try hard not to refuse an opportunity to learn something or do something when your supervisor offers it. You never know who you will meet and how it will help you. Number four, be gracious and show your appreciation to your sponsors by doing the best job you can. Your sponsor may have put some of their reputation or political capital on the line to have you selected versus a student from another school. Thank you letters, not emails, are always time well spent. The quality of your work will affect the students from UMass that follow after you and their ability to gain an internship. Number five, work at building lasting professional contacts wherever you go. You may never know when you'll need help in a particular area or professional reference. It's a lot easier to get help if you check in with your mentors from time to time. Most people are happy to help if you approach them in the right way. Number six, always tell the truth in your writing, research, arguments. Never overstate the facts to fit your position. Always verify your work. Lawyers are held to very high standards of ethical conduct. The illegal, unethical conduct of your boss, associates, and others can sometimes be imputed to you. Following orders is not a defense. If you're not comfortable doing something you're asked to do, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Being a lawyer is a 24-hour a day job. Your conduct and behavior off the job, as well as in your personal life, can affect your career too. And number seven, don't be afraid to ask for help during your internship and career. If you don't understand something, don't hesitate to let your supervisor know as soon as possible. Up till this point, Leslie and my trial court colleagues would probably tell you that my remarks are largely familiar to last year's. Yes, they are. In the spirit of Ma Martina McBride's new album called Everlasting, the things that needed to be said really had to be said honestly in pretty much the same way. So what's the significance of this little CD, 1989? Mind you, I purchased the DLX version of this for your benefit at $18 <laughs> at Target with bonus tracks, voice memos, and personal Polaroid photos of T-Swizzle for this presentation. <laughs> but why? What does it all mean? Give me a moment and I'll get there. When preparing for this presentation, I asked a few friends who are lawyers what they thought I should talk to you about. One friend who was an assistant U.S. attorney in Boston told me, quote, the one thing I always tell them that they don't expect is to be kind to one another, including your adversaries. The bar is small and they'll be running into each other for years to come. I always use the example of hardcore litigation, papering up the file, always filing motions, never agreeing to extensions. Then the day comes that you need it and the person you tortured is on the other side. You're in trouble then. I do the whole, you have your word and your time in this business, and once your reputation is sullied, life will be difficult. My friend said, quote, I never feel like my crazy experiences are valuable. But my colleagues' experiences really are valuable. They're almost everything. My friend went on to point out that relationships literally run through everything I do, whether it's with the court and defense counsel, marshals, probation, or the state or local officials. Like 1989 and Taylor Swift, your legal career is all about relationships, and no one is better at describing relationships than Taylor Swift. <laughs> Taylor Swift was born on December 13, 1989, hence the title name. Taylor said, quote, I listened to a lot of 80s pop. I really loved the chances they were taking, how bold it was. It was apparently a time of limitless potential. The idea you could do what you want, be what you want, the idea of endless possibility was kind of a theme in the last two years of my life. As she described herself in an op-ed piece she wrote for the Wall Street Journal, she is, quote, an enthusiastic optimist. 
I'm sure there are a few Swifties out in the audience, diehard supporters of Miss Swift, if you would be brave enough to admit it in front of your peers. Anyone want to volunteer their favorite song and a reason for it? I didn't think so. <laughs> My favorite songs are You Belong With Me and Back to December. My daughter Margot was devoted to You Belong With Me when it came out in 2008 on the Fearless album. It portrays the story of an average band girl who gets to go to the prom with the boy of her dreams to the surprise of everyone. This kind of happened for me in a similar way at my high school prom, so I like it. The, the 2010 Back to December on the Speak Now album is less of a hit, but sings of a crash and burn in a romance where you wish you could get a do-over. Ms. Swift, however, with wisdom far ahead of her years, says, quote, I go back in time and change it, but I can't. My daughter loves to sing that chorus for me when either of us makes a mistake. As her biggest Christmas present ever, we saw Taylor Swift perform at Gillette Stadium that year. It was one of the best shows I've ever seen. Moving forward, as Taylor Swift always does, in 1989, Taylor swings about Shake It Off, where play is going to play, play, and hate is going to hate. But she never misses a sick beat because she's lightning on my feet and keeps on moving. If there's not a clearer reference to being a lawyer in the song, I don't know what it is. <laughs> then there's the starkly titled Bad Blood, where she sings about mad love, but now we've got bad blood. You definitely don't want bad blood with a judge or a client. Going back to one of her biggest 2010 hits, Mean, I don't know anyone who was a lawyer who hasn't asked her memorable line in court, Why'd you have to be so mean? <laughs> the New York Times, in a review of 1989, said that Taylor Swift, quote, has written herself a narrative in which she's still the outsider. She is the butterfingers in a group of experts, the approachable one in a sea of high post, the small town girl learning to navigate the big city. In essence, that's who you are, and if you're not, that's who you should be. You're a group of very talented and accomplished men and women embarking on your future, just like Taylor Swift. You should be open to change with an optimistic sense of courage, respect, humility for the world you're now entering. But how do I tell you about relationships in the law? That's really a huge topic, but it has a lot to do with who you are and challenging yourself to grow, to stand up for something, and to be a person other people can count on. My friend, who was the assistant U.S. attorney, concluded her message to me saying, quote, what we both do affects people's lives every day, and when they see us, it's because of something really important to them. I try to never forget that. That's truly what it's about. How well you interact with people, more than anything, will determine how well you will do as a lawyer, and more importantly, how happy you'll be in life. Taylor Swift advises, quote, I choose my friends based on people I have things in common with, or people who challenge me. There's something really inspiring about people who know what they want, people who are passionate about something. You want to be around smart, exciting people. I think that just brings you up. As Taylor says, follow your gut feeling, learn from your mistakes, have the courage to change, know that who you are is who you choose to be, and that nothing good comes without loss and hardship and constant struggle. Just so you don't think that I ripped off Time Magazine, <laughs> I started working on my presentation a week ago. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity to talk with you. I wish you much success in your future legal career. As Taylor Swift has embarked on to a new adventure in New York, I urge you to listen to her song, Welcome to New York. I hope that you find your New York and that your journey to your personal Ithaca is long and full of adventure and knowledge. Um, that was that you you I did yourself. Well done. Oh, thank you. Well done. And and truly as always inspiring. So Richard, that leaves you in the unenviable place of following Michael and, and, and that's that's a tough act to follow. No, I'm always grateful uh, for following Michael because he's left nothing for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> um I just want to say uh, a, a word about perspective on the school. Uh, I've been in the Bedford for over 50 years now, and that was before there was any UMass, any thought of a law school. 
then he thought of a lot of important things in, in the educational world. Uh, and the, the law school has filled a great need and uh, it's been widely recognized for what it's done for this area, but uh, not only this area, but the state. So um, we have a lot of connections uh, in the school with the appeals court. Uh, I think you probably all know uh, Justice Jacobs and Justice Seifer. Uh, uh, Justice Jacobs retired from the court a few years ago, and Justice Seifer is uh, second in seniority on our court. Um, and you know that um, there have been a couple of interns from here in our court, uh, but we uh, have now two uh, students who have made it into clerkships. Uh, Mario Nimock, who is uh, now in private practice, but was clerk for a year. And uh, Sarah Cedarholm is going to be a clerk, um, one of the two for uh, Chief Justice Proposa. And uh, also, uh, there's a great connection uh, with Justice Proposa. He was born in New Bedford and uh, served on the district court for a while uh, in Fall River. So uh, you couldn't have a better connection with the outside world, I think. Uh, this school has tremendous potential. And uh, one, one of these days, we may get a clerk on the SJC, too. Um, but I don't think it's necessary to tell you much about the court. Uh, there's a very good web page. Uh, Occasionally, the court uh, sits uh, at this school or in the area. They recently were in Fall River. And um, if you can't make one of those, you ought to go to Boston and see some oral arguments sometime. And have any of you <coughs> been in the John Adams Courthouse in Boston? No. It, those who haven't are, are missing a great treat. Um, you really should go, and whether you listen to oral arguments or not. Um, the uh, appeals court has got uh, 25 justices, um, 26 law clerks that the chief gets to, and um, there are, uh, I think, presently eight interns uh, serving. Um, it is very competitive, there's no, no doubt about it, because dealing with the, the big law schools, and um, so we're very happy to finally crack the barrier to get uh, students from here into clerkships. Um, and I think that that will increase. The um, court is fairly new, it was only organized in 1972. Uh, we get every kind of case from all the trial courts except first degree murder. So the, the work is really interesting. And although you're dealing with a cold record, I think it, you'd find if you haven't already that cold records have a way of uh, coming to life, and uh, I really can't say that of all the cases I've ever seen that there wasn't one that had some interest. They really do grab you at some point. Um, I don't know whether uh, any of you have visited the website, but I think that's the place to go, and uh, it's been well said follow the instructions very carefully. Um, the, um, I, I, I don't know that I really should say any more about that, uh, but obviously if you do have uh, any questions about the process or 
general corrections and so on, uh, you have access to a lot of us now. Uh, I'm, I'm, I work in New Bedford, and I'd be happy to talk to any of you about any, any doings of the court or uh, any, any way I could be of any assistance. Um, um, with all, with, just to follow up on that point, so the sheet that has the panels lists on it, there are email addresses. Um, instead of Chief Justice Cutler's email address, I put Jill Zider's email address. Jill is um, sort of like uh, Romeo and Denise in the sense that she oversees uh, the clerks and the interns and would probably have that kind of information you're looking for. So I hope that was okay with you, Judge, that I put yeah, those um, emails. She's in. actually not technically in charge of interns and clerks. Um, the judges are. Okay. She's the um, she's the court court administrator. assistant yeah. court administrator. And um, so she does more uh, administrative okay. uh, role, but she's certainly knowledgeable and I know she would be happy okay. if and to, if anybody connected with her to either pass on the proper information or or forward it. Um, okay. She's you know she's a wonderful resource. Is there a better resource than her at this well, point? Uh, would Ellen right now resource? we don't uh, there's no way to really just call someone to ask for information. Probably you're right. Jill is probably the best uh, the best person to talk with. Um, although Ellen Fiadaka is our judicial secretary and she'll take in the applications that, and she'll forward them to the judges. So really it's it's really done by the seven judges um, ultimately. Yeah. Which talks about what a unique experience it is to work <laughs> in the land court. Well, we, have no, we have no staff, did I mention that? <laughs> Part of the job, right? You know, you get the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I, I'd just like to re reinforce one final thing. Please. Um, if, if you're going for an appellate clerkship, um, you shouldn't overlook uh, being an intern or uh, clerking in a, in a trial court. Uh, and you might want to, at some point, pursue those av avenues together. But um, those experiences would would be very helpful in uh, getting an appellate clerkship. And if you look at, so one of the handouts on the side are, it's entitled Postgraduate Judicial Clerkships. Um, a lot of what people talked about here today is included in this. Uh, it talks about what a clerkship is, what clerks do, what are the advantages of having a clerkship, what steps should I take while I'm in school to get a clerkship, and then there's a whole section just on uh, application requirements and where to look for clerkships and how to figure out whether this clerkship or that clerkship is a good opportunity or something I, I can't do. Um, so I think a lot of the, and there's also a list of resources <coughs> in, within there, uh, as well as our live resources. And you know, I, I think that um, you're lucky that they have offered to make themselves available because I think that it's a huge resource. And as you can tell, each of the courts is just a little bit different and has their own thing. And one might not be right for you, but another one, on the other hand, would be. Um, so having said that, what I'd like to do is conclude and give everybody the opportunity to talk directly to any of our panelists, one-on-one -on -one questions, things like that. So um, having said that, I want to thank you all for coming again. This was terrific. I really appreciate your time. Oh, but it was running, I think. It might be on the battery.